this week we're looking at a, a new theme. And the motivation for this theme was basically a question that was put on, on Thursday during the question and answer session. Someone wanted me to speak on Galatians 2.20 where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, I no longer live. So I thought of that, uh, giving answer to them, I thought, why not share a message on the different relationships affected on the cross, different relationships. This particular uh, relationship between us and ourselves, the man and the self, uh, crucifying the self is one aspect of Christ's work on the cross. I have been crucified with Christ, meaning myself had been crucified with Christ. So I thought of uh, uh, different relationships to the cross, and I'm going to look at detail uh, in these three sessions. Uh, today, I'll look at man and God, man and the devil, man and man, man and the world, and man and himself. Uh, man and God have been established. Uh, it was not there before, established to the cross. Man and the devil was there before, but through the cross, it is broken completely. I'm going to look at that to, uh, tonight. On uh, Thursday, we look at man and man, which was many times broken, but re restored through the cross. We have peace with each other through the cross. Man and himself, uh, broken, because now the ego has to be killed. And finally, man and the world, also broken. So man and man established, man and God established, Man and devil broken, man and the world broken, man and himself broken. If I look at in detail today on uh, man and God relationship and man and the devil. Actually, why is there a search for God among mankind? Why do people have to search for God? When you're born to the world, we do not know God automatically. And many people in this world search for God. They search for truth because they are cut off from God. Mankind is generally cut off from God because of sin of man. Within the Bible, when God first created Adam and Eve, they had fellowship with God. They were in the Garden of Eden. And the book of Genesis, chapter 2, 16, 17, the Lord told Adam and Eve, they need from every tree in the garden. Because every tree in the Garden of Eden had fruits which were good for food and pleasing to the eye. All the trees had fruits, good for food, pleasing to the eye. But the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were told not to eat of that tree. They, they were commanded by God not to eat from the tree. And God said, if you eat from that tree, fruit of that tree, you will die. You will die. The word dying, the word death actually means separation. Separation. We are very familiar with the physical death, which is separation of the spirit of man from the body of man. When the spirit leaves the body, the body dies, it perishes, it decays. But the real serious separation, serious death is separation of the human spirit from the spirit of God. We know very clearly from the Bible, uh, from John 4.24, God is spirit. God is spirit. And uh, the human being has a spirit, a soul, and a body. And when man sinned against God, when God told man, if you eat from this tree, you will die, what he meant was, your spirit will be separated from my spirit, cut off from me. And that's how all the problems of the world began. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were cut off from God and the entire human personality got corrupted. The body got corrupted, prone to sickness, disease and also death. The spirit was separated from God, cut off from God. The soul got corrupted, the mind got corrupted. That's why man's wisdom is not perfect. There's something called man's wisdom and God's wisdom. Man's wisdom is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. It's mentioned in the book of James, chapter 3, verse 16, 13 to 16. So man was cut off from God. And since man's spirit was cut off from God, there has been a desire on the part of mankind from the very beginning to search for God. 
because something is missing in a human being. It was the Pascal who first said, in every human being, there's a vacuum which only God can fill. That's why as a, a search for God, search for truth, and from the beginning of time, this has been there because man was cut off from God. But God loves all mankind. Do you know that? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God loves every human being in the world. Psalm 145 verse 9, the Old Testament, Psalm 145 verse 9. God is good to all. His compassion is over all he has made. His compassion is over all he has made. Every human being, animal, bird, reptile, whatever is created, he has compassion on. And God had a plan, even before man sinned, to reconcile man to himself. So when the Lord gave the Old Testament law to the Israelites, he also told them, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 11, the life of the creature is in the blood. I have been given blood as an atonement for sin. As early as in the book of uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Lord spoke about blood. That's why man is not supposed to eat meat with blood in it. Blood is precious. Because blood was earmarked by God to be the payment for the sins of the whole world. Since man's spirit, was, uh, man's spirit was contaminated by spirit, unless the spirit is cleansed and made perfect, man cannot be reconciled to God. No human being can come to God on his own. However good we are, however nice we are, when we leave this world, when the spirit comes out, because of one sin in the spirit, it cannot enter into God's presence. We are cut off from God. But God had made a plan and Christ was chosen as a Lamb of God, as a sacrifice for sins from the foundations of the world. Now, in every human being, again, there has been an understanding and a belief that sacrifice for sins has to be made. There has to be a sacrifice for sins. So they were offering sacrifices, different civilizations, believing that uh, sacrifice of animal, bird, uh, animal or a bull or goat has to be made for the sins of mankind in different civilizations. And Israel, uh, to the Israelites, as early as Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, the Lord told Moses about a sacrifice for sins, a Passover lamb. It has to be a year old male without defect. A year old male, a lamb or a goat without defect. Let me explain later on what the defect actually meant. The Old Testament sacrifices were actually a foreshadow of the real sacrifice of Christ. Without defect means without any injury on the animal, smooth skin, no injuries, and it has to be, uh, at least skin has to be perfect. Uh, a year, year old male without defect. That was the, uh, what got ordained in the Old Testament time. As a as symbolic of the ultimate sacrifice for sins. Now they offer those sacrifices, and the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it's impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to take away sin. Impossible. It's only a foreshadow. It is only before Christ came. These, uh, these sacrifices were symbolic of the ultimate Passover lamb who would be Christ, a year old male without defect. Again, Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3 also says the same thing. Here, old male without defect. Now, some Israelites thought animals are a lower form of life, humans are a higher form of life. Let me offer human sacrifice. They actually offered human sacrifice. In Psalm 49, 7 to 9, we read, Psalm 49, 7 to 9 is written, No man can redeem the life of another man. Or give to God a ransom for life. A ransom for life is too costly. No payment is ever enough that a man can go on forever and not see decay. So animal sacrifice cannot take away sin. Human sacrifice cannot say, take away sin. Yet the Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no sacrifice for sins. 
So Christ was sent into the world. Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. A body of flesh and blood was prepared in the womb of the Virgin Mary for the Messiah, the Christ to come and live and is born into the world. 2000 years ago. Hebrews chapter 2, 14, 15 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he will destroy the one who holds the power of death. A power of death. That's the devil. And free those. So all the lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Animal sacrifice cannot take away sin. Human sacrifice cannot take away sin. Yet the Bible says blood has to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. So Christ became man, a body of flesh and blood was prepared for him to come and live, to be sacrificed on the cross as a payment for the sins of the whole world. So when Christ entered the world, he told the Father in heaven, in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5, sacrifices and burnt offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Here I am. I come to do your will. That's why Christ entered the world. Because a sacrifice for sins to reconcile man to God, to pay the price of the sin for the sins of the mankind, it has to be a perfect sacrifice. A perfect sacrifice. Which only God can make. Only God is perfect. Nobody else is perfect. And that's why he had to become man was given the name Jesus or Yeshua. Before that, he was the Christ, the Messiah. He was the Son of God. He was the Word of God. When he entered the world in flesh and blood, he was given the name Jesus or Yeshua, as they call him. Yeshua HaMasiha, as they would say in those days, call him the Jesus the Christ. And a body of flesh and blood was prepared for the sinless Son of God to come and live and offer himself to God as a sinless sacrifice. Everything about him was a miracle. As you go through this message, you'll understand the end of it. Why Christ is the only way of salvation? Why is the only way? We go and tell many people of other faiths that Jesus is the only way. But uh, they don't understand why he is the only way. To say he's the only way is fine. It's true. Jesus said that. But why is the only way? We'll realize on the Bible. There's never been a life like Christ. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. And the purpose of his coming was to save mankind from sin, to reconcile man to God, and to unite man with God. This is the cry of people in India those days. Long time ago, they understood that man is cut off from God. They were searching for God. They believe God to be Paramatma, the highest spirit. They believe they had a Jivatma, a human spirit. And the Jivatma and Paramatma are separated because of sin, a pap, as they would say. And the whole purpose of life is how we can find union with God. A very well known prayer, they pray those days, even today, there are many people pray their prayer. Asatama Satya Gamaya. Bring me from the unreal to the truth. Tamasama Jyotir Gamaya. Bring me from darkness to light. Mrityuma Amritam Gamaya. Bring me from mortality to immortality. The answer for all of that is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll come to that later. How is the answer? So you're going to understand tonight. Once again, remind ourselves why he's the only way. Why only through him we can be reconciled to God. And man and God are reconciled by the perfect sacrifice of Christ. Everything about him was a miracle. His birth was a miracle. He was born of a virgin. Isaiah 7.14 His life was a miracle. In him there was no sin. 1 John 3.5 His death was a miracle. He dismissed his spirit. 27 chapter of Matthew verse 50 After the body was put in a tomb, on the third day, he rose from the dead 
because it was impossible for death to hold him. Acts 2.24, impossible. Everything about him was a miracle. In him there was no sin. That's why he is a personification of blemishlessness. Without defect. What are the Old Testament sacrifices? Year old male without defect. Without a flaw. That is symbolic of the perfect life of Christ. No other human being in the history of this world has been sinless except Jesus. That's why he's referred to as the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 19, we read 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 19. It's not the perishable things such as silver or gold. You are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. His ultimate perfect lamb of God. Sacrifice of God. Lamb is sacrifice of God. Sacrifice for our sins. Romans 3.25 says, God presented him as a gift of atonement through faith in his blood. His blood is the blood spoken of by God, desired by God, required by God for the payment of the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. That's why we go to the whole world and tell the whole world, there's good news for you. The sacrifice for your sins on the cross. Only Jesus is the Savior. There's no other Savior. In the book of Old Testament, in the Old Testament, chapter 43, verse 11 of Isaiah, Isaiah 4, 11, God says, I, even I am your savior, apart from me, there's no savior. I am your savior, apart from me, there's no other savior. Psalm 68 verse 20 says, A God is a God who says, From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Death means separation. Escape from death means escape from separation, which is union, oneness with God. Let, now let's come back to the answer to this question of Paramatma, Jivatma, separation. That's a sacrifice of Christ on the cross. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 1920, Colossians chapter 1, 1920, it's written, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Making peace means making union, oneness, oneness, unity. So now, through the blood of Christ, because that blood has cleansed every sin in our heart, of every sin in our, in our, in our spirits by faith, our spirits are made perfect by the sacrifice. Sava spirit and God's spirit are now one. Man reconciled to God through the blood of Christ. Again in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10, Jesus spoke about how he said, I come to do your will. Before that, in the previous verses, here I am, I come to do your will. Hebrews 10, 5. And then verse 10 says, by that will, will of the Father to send Christ to the world to die for our sins, by that will, we've been made holy to sacrifice the body of Christ once for all. By that will of the Father, you and me have been made holy, perfect, but the sacrifice of the body of Christ once for all. That body consisting of flesh and blood prepared for him was holy and perfect because the life was perfect, blemishless Lamb of God. And because he is sinless, that's why his death was sufficient for our sins. Otherwise, one man dying for another man is nothing unusual. In the war, people die for the country. Our soldiers sacrifice on the uh, border for our country to save us from the enemies. So one man dying for another man is nothing new. In history, every soldier in the war dies for the country, for the other people, countrymen. 
one man and another man is nothing great. But Christ, who is God become man, sinless son of God, dying for sins is very, very special. The most special event ever in the history of mankind. We are reconciled to God by faith in that blood. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we justify through faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom? We gain access by faith. This grace in which we now stand. We stand on the grace of God. And therefore, let's thank God for the amazing reconciliation. We are reconciled to God through Christ. Paramatma, Jivatma separated before. Man was cut off from God. No relationship with God. That has been restored by the blood of Christ. We are reconciled to God today by that sacrifice. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 onwards, Paul writes, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the means of reconciliation. God that God is reconciling the whole world to Himself in Christ. We, have, we appeal on behalf of God to people. He reconciles the whole world to Himself through Christ. There's no other way. That's why Jesus said, "The sinless Son of God said, who can never tell a lie, it's impossible for God to tell a lie." You know, sometimes we, you know, God is omnipotent; He can do everything. There are two things God cannot do: impossible for God. You know what that is? One is to tell a lie. Hebrews 6, 18 says, it's impossible for God to tell a lie. He can't tell a lie. Impossible. That's impossible for God. Also, God cannot be tempted. James 1, 13 to 15. God cannot be tempted. Impossible for him to be tempted. Impossible for him to tell a lie. And he said, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I mean, the Father is reconciled to God through Jesus. By calling upon the name of Jesus, we are saved from death. We are one with God. First Corinthians 6, 17 says, He unites himself with the Lord, is one with him in spirit. We are one with God. That oneness will never be taken away. Unless we, we go away from God and he'll even then by the blood we come back to him. He'll never, he will never forsake us. We might be faithless, he remains faithful. Because at the point of time we accept Christ as Savior. Lord. That's how we are saved. Built by believing he rose from the dead and confess the mouth of Jesus Christ Lord, we are saved. Every human being in the world must believe in this gift of salvation and accept Christ as Savior and Lord. Then you become the children of God. When a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. He comes and dwells in us as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. And thereon, we are called to live for him and enjoy this new relationship with him. That prayer in the olden days in India has been answered through Christ. Paramatma, Jeevatma, separation made good by the blood of Christ. Reconciled to God. Also, the cry of mankind for the truth, for light, and for immortality. Bring me from the unreal to the truth. Answer, John 14, 6, he says, I am the truth. Bring me from darkness to light. Jesus says in John 8, 12, I am the light of this world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Mortality to immortality. Answer, Jesus. Second Timothy 1.10 Jesus destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. He destroyed death on the cross. Once and for all on the cross. He won the victory over the one who holds the power of death, that is the devil, on the cross. The cross is the power of God for us. At one point of time he told the Jews, in John 8, 24, I have told you, you will die in your sins if you do not believe I am the one I claim to be. 
you will die in your sins. But praise God, today, even though we are sinners, he paid the price for our sins. And even though we die physically, we will not die spiritually because we have been given new life. In John 11, 25, Jesus says, I am resurrection and the life. He believes in me, will live even though he dies. So through the cross, the first relationship affected is man and God. Earlier, no relationship, the cut off from God. Now, by the blood of Christ, established, and today we've been made the God's children. He purchased us to be his own. We are his own. We belong to him today. This is the beautiful culmination of all this. In the book of Revelation, where we read about the 24 elders and the four living creatures worshipping the Lamb of God, the blemishless Lamb of God without defect, Jesus Christ the Lord, who takes this scroll of judgment from the hand of the Ancient of Days, the Father in Heaven. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, 9 and 10, we read, they all worship him. They are bowed down and worship him. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. Seals means judgment for the world. Because you were slain and by your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they reign on the earth. You and me are a kingdom. We are priests of God most high. Purchased by his blood. He was slain. And by his blood he purchased us. We belong to him. The first rejoice in the fact that we are his children. will remain his children. So man and God established to the cross. They become a second relationship. Man the devil broken. Before he came to Christ, most of us may not be very great sinners as we thought we were. We are following the world. We follow the ways of the world. When anyone follows the ways of the world, he's actually following the devil. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. We didn't know the devil. We are following the world. And in the prince of this world, and he tempts people through the things of this world. When you follow the world, we're actually following the devil. Only when you turn to Christ, we are reconciled to God. If we're not reconciled to God, we are under the control of the evil one. In 1 John 5, 19, John writes, We are children of God and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 22, we read, Scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. So before we turn to Christ, we didn't realize it. We're actually prisoners of sin. We have a devil's control. And he was controlling us without us knowing it. Some people know it. Who follow the occult world. People in the witchcraft, sorcery, occult world. They know what they're doing. They know they're worshipping evil spirits. But most people don't know. They are in bondage. They are blinded by the evil one. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Yes, so don't condemn unbelievers. Never condemn anybody. The Lord never condemned anybody. He came to save people, not to condemn people. When people do terrible things in this world, they are under devil's control. Our enemy is not people. Our enemy is the devil. Don't show your frustration on people. There's no frustration for us. We belong to Jesus. But understand, we were under devil's control. We were enemies of God. Colossians 121 says, believers that are once enemies of God in our minds because of evil behavior. We had a relationship with the devil. You didn't realize that. He was controlling us. From the Garden of Eden onwards, when man sinned against God, man came under the control of the evil one. But the Lord to the prophets prophesied about that relationship being broken. Long now back, he said, I'll break the relationship to the prophets. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 61 from verse 1, it talks about the anointing of the Messiah. It's called the Messianic prophecy. 
the spirit of the sovereign God upon me. The spirit of the sovereign God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners. Who are the captives? Who are the prisoners? People of this world, people of this world, who are following the world, are prisoners of sin, prisoners of the devil, captives. They don't realize that. But as I prophesied, that when the Messiah comes, the Holy Spirit will be upon him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release them from prisoners, to set them free from the devil. And at the appropriate time, Christ enter the world. Prophesied by every prophet in the Old Testament. Every prophet in the Old Testament prophesied about the coming of the Messiah and forgiveness of sins for all mankind. In fact, when Peter spoke to the household of Cornelius in Acts 10 43, he says, All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. The first time, the first time we read about this victory of Christ over the devil on the cross was in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we read when the Lord uh, put a curse upon uh, because of the sin of man, man, Adam and Eve, and also on the devil. Genesis 3, 15. He said, I put enmity between you and the woman your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring will strike your head. You will strike his heel, her heel, her, her offspring's heel. You will strike the heel of the offspring of the woman. Her offspring will strike your head. What does that mean? On the cross, the devil, using people under his control, struck the heel of the Messiah put nails into his hands and legs. He thought doing something wonderful. But this offspring of the woman struck the head of the devil. This is his work on the cross. 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. At the appropriate time, God entered the world. It says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, to embrace the full righteous sins. At that point, time, he entered the world. When he entered the world, he knew why he had come. He had come to set mankind free from the devil and reconcile man to God. You already spoke about that. Reconciling mankind to God and also set mankind free from the devil's control. Because mankind is under the devil's control. We are prisoners of sin, prisoners of the devil. He came to set us free. As he walked this earth, he says in Acts 10 38, but around Jesus Christ, not that, with Holy Spirit power, he went around doing good. Healing all were under devil's control because God was with him. And when he entered the world, the world didn't recognize him. He says in John 1.10, he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. The world didn't recognize him. The Jews didn't recognize him. He was the prince. He was their uh, peace, prince of peace he is. He was their peace. Prophesied by Micah in chapter 5, verse 5, he will be that peace. When peace came down the Mount of Olives towards Jerusalem, they didn't recognize him. But the Lord wept over Jerusalem. If you only you are known today, what will bring you peace? Now it's hidden from you. Because you didn't recognize God's coming to you. God's coming. Christ's coming is God's coming. Luke 19, 41 to 44. They didn't recognize him. The world didn't recognize him. The Jews didn't recognize him. But very interestingly, the devil recognized him. The devil recognized him. One point of time, the demons, in the, uh, possessing a certain person, they tell Jesus, book of Matthew 8, 29, 
What do you want with the Son of the Most High God? Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? They knew the appointed time for them to be tortured in hell. They knew that. They even knew this is not the time. Why have you come now? This is not judgment day. They knew about that. They knew something about the future they know. Judgment day they'll be tortured. But not now. Why have you come now? They didn't know why he came. They didn't know why he came. As the Lord walked this earth, he did amazing things. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse also leprosy. At one point of time, he told the Jews in John 8, 31, 32. If you hold on to my teaching, you really my disciples, then you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. You will know the truth. You don't know the truth yet. That means you will know the truth. One day you know the truth. And the truth will set you free. They don't understand what he meant by that. They say, we are Abraham descendants. We have never been slaves of anybody. How can I say you set us free? We are not slaves. And Jesus says, he who sins is a slave to sin. He was speaking about slavery to sin, which also means slavery to the evil one. He said, you will know the truth one day. He told Thomas, I am the truth. He didn't tell Jews that. In John 14, 6, he told Thomas, I am the truth. But not to the Jews. You will know the truth. Truth will set you free. What he meant was freedom from the devil, freedom from sin. Separation from the devil, oneness with God. That's what he's talking about. Didn't understand that. When they say the Abraham descendants, the Lord says, I know you are. I know you are. John 8, 37. Then they say, Abraham is our father. Verse 39 of John 8. And then 40 verse was, the only father we have is God himself. When they say we're Abraham descendants, he says, I know you're Abraham descendants. That I know. When they say Abraham is our father, you know what he says? John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil. The devil. What are things to say? That's the reality. They are under devil's control. Their relationship with the devil, they didn't realize that. He said, I've come to set you free. I've come to set you free. Now, he told the Jews that when he was asked by people to be, to, for him to teach them how to pray, he gave a pattern of prayer, which we all call the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer prescribed by Jesus to people. It's not Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer is what he prayed to the Father. The 17th chapter of John. The Father, when he prayed to the Father Jesus, that is called the Lord's Prayer, his prayer. But what we say Lord's Prayer is basically the, the prayer the Lord gave to people to pray. Very, very well-known prayer. Every Sunday people pray in churches. In the course of the prayer, the one part goes like this. Matthew 6.13. Matthew 6.13 says, the Lord told them to pray in this manner. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Very profound statement. In other words, the word deliver means rescue. As many other word, deliver, rescue. Ryomai in Greek. Ryomai means rescue me. I'm in bondage. I'm trapped. I'm in prison. Rescue me. Deliver us from evil. Rescue us from evil. Actually, the word evil there is porneros in Greek. Porneros means the evil one. When in bondage to sin, you're in bondage to the devil. So the Lord telling them to pray, don't leave us in temptation. I can't face temptation. Don't lead me in temptation. Rather, deliver me from the evil one. That's the prayer he prescribed. That prayer was answered by the Lord himself. By the truth on the cross. The truth will set you free, he told them. To the Jews. Disciples, he says, the Palin's manner. And on the cross, when he shed blood, by that blood, he rescued mankind from the evil one. 
that the devil did not know. He did not know why Christ came to the world this time. He knew there's a time for him to be judged, judgment day. This is not the time. Why have you come now? Have you come to torture before the appointed time? He had a doubt in his heart. Why is he come now? It's not the time. Is he going to torture us? As Christ hung on the cross, devil must have thought. Sometime back, I asked him a question. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? I asked him a question. He didn't answer me. Now I am torturing him. I put nails into his heels. I struck his heel. He didn't know his head is going to be destroyed. He never realized that Christ is going to destroy the works of the devil on the cross. He must have thought, I was so worried about him. He's come to torture me. Now I am torturing him. I don't know whether the devil can rejoice or not. I have no idea. If at all the devil can rejoice, he must have rejoiced at the point of time when Christ shed blood on the cross, went through all that pain. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was because he was cut off from God. He, he wanted to avoid the cross not because of pain. He knew that when he hung on the cross, the whole world sins will be upon, the, upon him. The whole world sins be upon him. And the father takes eyes off the Lord. Habakkuk 1.13 says, God is so pure, he cannot look upon evil. All your sins and my sins were nailed on that cross. Everybody's sins were on the cross. Imagine how it must have been. All the evil in the world was heaped upon Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to become a sin for us, to become a sin offering for us. That in him, he made me and become the righteousness of God. So he knew that the father would take his eyes off the law. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that time, devil must have thought, ah, see what he's saying. He's saying God has forsaken him. When he finished his work on the cross, on the third day, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. What a shock for the devil. Not just that. Later on, he would empower his children to manifest that victory over the devil on the cross. The Lord's prayer which we pray, this part, there was some evil, was fulfilled on the cross. How do you know that? After the cross, we read in Colossians chapter 1, 13, 14. Colossians chapter 1, 13, 14. For he has rescued us, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And has brought us to the kingdom of the son he loves. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He has rescued us. So this relationship with the devil, which was there before, we are under his control. We tried so hard to come out of sin, we could not. We had bondages, addictions. So people are having addictions, bondages. They want to do good. Something in the heart tells them, do good. But they are not able to do good. Because they are under bondage. Minds are blinded. They thought they are serving God. Many people think they are serving God, they are serving the devil. Because he masked as an angel of light. Second Corinthians 11.14 says, Even Satan masked as an angel of light. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers. Everything began null and void on the cross. Because on the cross, Christ rescued mankind from devil's control and brought us into his kingdom. Now, today, light has come. When you follow Jesus, he the light of the world. You don't walk in darkness. You walk in light. And therefore, light destroys darkness. Light makes everything clear. Now, our minds are open. Our hearts are cleansed. And we can have authority over all the thoughts that come to us. And we can choose to live for the Lord Jesus Christ today. We are out of devil's control. We have been set free. Today when you pray the Lord's prayer and say, Lord, deliver us from evil. Instead of talking to God, to listen to God, you know what he will say? My dear child, don't you know, 2,000 years ago, I delivered you from the evil one. You are now in my kingdom. You are no longer under devil's control. I have set you free. 
we are free indeed. He said, when the son sets you free, be free indeed. Today, when you and me sin against God, I sin against God. If I say I don't sin, I'll be a hypocrite. When I sin against God today, it's because of my own choice. My obstinacy. My rebellion. I don't blame the devil. I don't blame God for not giving me strength. He always gives strength. Sometimes I don't seek his strength. People do that. Because it says in Second Cor sorry, in First Corinthians 10 13, First Corinthians 10 13, God is faithful. He won't only be tested more than he can bear. The lady temptation is they have taken stand up for it. So he does his part. We don't depend upon him. And I don't blame the devil. If I sin, it's because I have chose to sin. My body, eyes, the ears, the mouth tends to get attracted to things of this world. But praise God, there's victory. Victory over our body also. Is what the Apostle Paul experienced. One point of time he said, what I want to do, I'm not able to do. I don't want to do, I'm doing. Who does give me the body of death? Thanks be to God, to Jesus Christ our Lord. We have victory in Jesus' name. Today our problem is not the devil, the problem is our body. In uh, Romans 7.24, Jesus says, uh, Paul writes, Romans 7.24, What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from the body of death? Who will rescue me from this body? Then say, who rescues me from the devil? He's been rescued from the devil. The problem is the body, the five senses. Even for that, we have victory through the Holy Spirit. So today, we have been set free. Man and the evil one broken. Man and God reconciled. So don't have anything to do with the evil one. We are set free completely. That's what I'll find in the book of uh, Galatians, chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, So freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Don't let us be burned again by yoke of slavery. Stand firm then. Don't let us be burned again by yoke of slavery. You'll be set free. Why don't you go back to slavery? Why put on a yoke upon yourself? A yoke to Jesus. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, Paul writes, You must tell me God, God, God to be free. Don't use the freedom to indulge in sinful nature. First, Peter chapter 2, verse 16, Live as free men. We don't use the freedom as a cover up for evil. We have been set free. We are so free today that we can use the freedom to go back to prison. Let's not do that. Today we are in the same situation as Adam and Eve were before they ate from that tree. Before they ate from the tree of the garden of, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the garden, they were free, not under devil's control. Free to obey God, free to disobey God. They knew the will of God. God told them, eat from the tree, you will die. They knew the will of God, but they chose to go against God's will. They use their free will to go against God's will. After they sinned against God, mankind came under control of the devil. Mankind had no choice in bondage, under devil's control, no choice in prisoners. But Christ set us free. Now we are so free as God's people, we can choose to obey God, we can choose to disobey God. God has given us a free will. God wants you and me today, since we are free, to find out his will and do his will. Ephesians 5.17 says, Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't be foolish. Understand God's will. We can know his will. He loves to reveal his will to us. We are set free. Today we have been renewed in the image of the creator. After we turn to Christ, we are a new creation. We are being renewed in the image of the Creator. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. In the Garden of Eden, when man sinned against God, the image of God got distorted. Spirit got corrupted. Body uh, uh, prone to sickness and disease and died. Corrupted, went to decay. Mind got corrupted. Now, because we are in Christ, we are renewed in the image of the Creator. More and more like Jesus. And therefore, we can know his will. 
He will reveal his will to us. And God wants us, his will is, his will is that we use our free will to find out his will and do his will. It may be the statement. His will is that his people have been set free. Find out his will using our own free will. Find out his will and do his will. Thereby, we preserve the peace and the joy of the Lord. Devil will like to make us think that you're under his control. He's a liar, father of lies. He'll try to make us think we're under his control. We're out of his control. Not only that, we've been given authority even over the devil in the name of Jesus. We're not just out of the prison. We are in God's kingdom. Okay, let me go back to Colossians 1, 13, 14. For he has rescued us from dominion of darkness and brought in the kingdom of the Son he loves. He has rescued us from dominion of darkness, whole dominion, whole realm of the spiritual world, evil world, we delivered from. Brought into God's kingdom in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We have been set free. Let's enjoy this freedom. Enjoy his kingdom of power, of peace and joy and Let's use our own free will, which is given us, to find out his will, revealed in the scriptures by the Holy Spirit, and do his will and manifest victory over the evil one. Every promise in the Bible, good promise, is ours today. And just one promise reveals to us about how, as God's people, we have been given authority even over the devil. Luke chapter 10, 18-19. The Lord says to the 70 disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample snakes and scorpions or all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. What an amazing promise. We are once prisoners of the devil, prisoners of sin. Now we have been given authority even over the devil in the name of Jesus. That's power in the name of Jesus. So don't fear the evil one. He fears us actually because he sees Christ in us. They are called to be people who have nothing to do with the needs of darkness. If you look at Ephesians 5.11, it says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. Completely stay away. Don't go back to prison. We are set free. We are yoked to Jesus. No, but one more yoke. There are many yokes people try to put us, put on upon us. We are yoked to Jesus. We are set free. Let's enjoy this freedom. So two relationships affected uh, today I spoke about. Man and God earlier separated. Now reconciled. Man and devil earlier reconciled. Not reconciled. Actually one with the devil we were following the world. Now that's broken. We've been set free. Prisoners have been set free. We can now enjoy God's kingdom. And Thursday, I'll talk about two more relationships. Man and man. Relationship with people around us. Man and himself. It's very important. How we are crucified to ourselves. On Sunday, I speak on man and the world. Based on Galatians 6.14. Where Paul writes, May I never boast except the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. Through which the world is crucified to me. And I've been crucified to the world. Let's close now. I'm going to pray. Let's thank God. Let's thank God for these two relationships. We are one with God today. One with him in God's kingdom. We are his children. And I'm always amazed how John, who was so close to Jesus, was very, very close to Jesus. When he understood by revelation what it meant to be a child of God, he writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, how great is the love the Father's lavishness we should be called the children of God. How great the love the Father has lavished on us. We should be called the children of God. To be called the child of God is the lavishness of God's love. Thank Him for that. Oh, thank you. I'm your child. I'm your child, Lord. You bought me by your blood, Lord. I belong to you, Lord. I'm one with you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You rescued me from the evil one. I am no more a, a follower of the evil one, Lord, of the world, but I follow you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Even though sometimes I'm faithless, you remain faithful. You know, sometimes when you get, we are faithless, we feel uh, convicted, we feel bad. Remember one thing, even though we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot disown himself. Second Timothy 2.13. Let's thank him.